What's up guys, Daniel Jason Booth here. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is recording. We're going to talk about what to do and what not to do before you hit record so that you can produce the best basis for mixing you possibly can. I'm also going to relate my personal experience when I was in my second year of audio college and it's a good one. Roll that intro. I'm just going to start out listing some of the things I believe are worth considering before you hit record and also some things to consider during recording. So here we go. Think ahead and get as much information as possible from the artist. If possible, go and see them performing live in show so that you can hear how they sound in real life. Know what instruments you're recording and put in place a plan of how you'd like to record it. Map out the setup and consult with the band to see that they're comfortable with it. When they come in, the bass player knows where they will stand and is totally comfortable with playing inside a closet. Upside down. Do your research. What mics sound good on a particular instrument? Maybe you have limited microphones, in which case you need to test everything out beforehand so you can understand the character of each. Know your gear. Read the manuals and understand the signal flow. If the singer needs reverb in their cans, but the guitar player doesn't, how do you route that? Headphone mixes are absolutely the key to making the artists feel comfortable. Ask them not to settle for an okay balance. Tease it out of some people who aren't as forthcoming. Notice how sound decays and how the tonal balance shifts in different parts of the room and where the sweet spots are. Figure out the setup, where people will be placed. Can they see each other properly? How will bleed affect the recording of instruments in the same room? Will you need to overdub some parts? Who needs power to run equipment and where's that power coming from? Clean the studio. Get rid of the funk. Deodorize. Vacuum. Learn the fine art of feng shui. Feng shui. Feng shui. I was close. Don't update your software on the day. Make sure nothing will break down during a performance. Test everything beforehand. Have spare cables, mics ready to go at a moment's notice. Have a backup plan in place for any conceivable issue that could crop up. Ask them to bring spare strings, capos, tuners, extra sticks, earplugs, batteries, spare didgeridoo, their own headphones if they have a strong preference. Prepare the band. Are they well rehearsed? Does everybody know all their parts inside and out? Help the band understand beforehand how long things may take to set up. Don't leave the guitarist sitting around with his thumb up his if in doubt, stagger the times that people come into the studio so they're not waiting around. Label folders, tracks and projects appropriately and know where you'll be backing up and when. Make everyone feel comfortable. Provide water, snacks, make sure the studio isn't freezing cold or like a sauna. Listen to the artist's requests no matter how bizarre and listen intently. Managing ego or insecurity is all part of the process and this is much easier to do when you have all the technical matters taken care of. If the artist is late, don't be pissed. Listen to their reasons and sympathize. Allow them to tell their story so that they get into the right headspace for recording. Reduce distractions. Turn off your mobiles or place on do not disturb. Ask the talent to do the same. The last thing you need is... The last thing you need is some random noise ruining a perp... Make sure you're in the right headspace. Even if you're not, throw cold water on your face, watch a cat video. The first recorded take could be the one, so be ready. You may never get that gold performance during rehearsals again. Have you had adequate rest? Even if you haven't, you are God. You are invincible and you cannot wait to hear the 25th vocal take of the first verse. Woo! Yeah! You nailed it! Let's do it again. I'm not tired at all. Lastly... Oh, hey there. Daniel from the future here. I was editing this video and I realised I actually missed two major things that I think are important to do during a recording session. So, here they are. When figuring out mic positions, it's imperative that you go into the recording space and you listen to the instrument you're recording, so that by way of reference, 
you know what it should sound like coming out of the speakers, at least as a starting point. The second tip I have is that once you have a few takes recorded, I recommend asking the band to come into the control room to hear for themselves. I know how valuable this was when I started working as a session drummer. The producer was requesting I lay off the tom-toms in certain song sections, and I didn't know why until I went into the control room and I listened back. Little did I realise the toms carried a lot more weight than I thought when I was playing them in the studio. So in the next few takes, I adjusted my playing and the recording improved significantly. Give the musicians a listen and allow them to fine tune or optimise their playing and you'll be rewarded with better performances. Anyway, back to this guy, wherever I put him. Save time at the end to purely experiment and try something different. Or maybe now you try that unorthodox recording technique you read in Sylvia Massey's book. In my second year of audio college, I was asked if I'd like to record a large band. The logistics alone of recording a band with eight members was challenging enough because everyone needed to be available as much as possible and the recording was to be live takes with as many people in the room as we could get. In the end, only six of the eight were available for the major recording days, but still, it was a massive challenge. The best step I ever took was to see them playing a show and understand exactly how they sounded live and what approach I needed to take to get a similar result in the studio. How did I prepare? I picked a studio that I was familiar with and had access to enough microphones and gear that I needed. I was obsessed with how I could use different microphone types and different microphone pickup patterns to record. To the extent of performing shootouts between like six or more microphones at once. I remember placing the microphones close together and aligning their capsules in what looked like a tree of microphones so that I could truly understand how they sounded different. Totally insane thing to do, but I was obsessed with learning and I remember learning a great deal from that. Having seen the band, I could already see the bigger picture and I also knew which songs from their set list I was going to record, which enabled me to then put a plan into place. Sometime during my second year, I was thinking about how to record and mix and had this epiphany that I should try to combine recording and mixing together. That's to say, try to nail the mix during the recording phase. I think. I mentioned that to a few of my classmates at the time and most of us were probably still stuck in this mindset that you record everything one by one and you piece it together later. With a clear vision that works too, but with this particular project, by the time I came to mixing it, it already sounded partially mixed. It took a lot on the planning side to get my head around the concept because it meant fully committing to how it was going to sound by the time it was finished and having enough foresight to execute a plan that was going to hopefully work. So I had a list of instruments, a list of microphones. I read all the manuals that I could get my grubby hands on and I started to form a recording plan with the end goal in mind. So for this particular group, that meant making the two female singers the central focus of the recording. They were going to be placed mostly in the center of the mix. From there, I decided who were the next important focal points, where I was going to place them in the room, how I was going to mic them, how I was going to use or avoid bleed from instruments. I discussed the plan with the band to determine who needed to see each other and who didn't. Taking all of this into account, I drafted a few different floor plans, weighed up the microphone positions and polar patterns, and what I came up with was pretty close to how the recording session finished up. There were a few changes which I'll talk about, but my hard work in planning got me 90% of the way there. As you can see, both singers are in the corner of the room, both facing out into the studio space so they can see the other musicians as well as themselves. Each of their microphone sets were essentially 90 degrees to one another. I had what they call a Blumline array consisting of two figure eight microphones, which serve several purposes. Firstly, the null or the deaf side of the pickup polar pattern, the figure eight, is pointing towards the opposing singer. That is the singer I don't want bleeding into that microphone. 
Reason being, I wanted to have control during mixing such that I had enough separation between the singers and could boost one up without hearing too much of the other bleeding through. And this actually worked pretty well, though I did implement a backup plan. I used a Bayer M88 and a Shaw SM57 just in case. Both these microphones are relatively insensitive, being dynamic microphones, so the bleed was not such a big issue. In the mix, I actually ended up using a combination of all four mics, but I could have just as easily used the figure eight condensers or just the two dynamic mics. You'll see that if I draw an imaginary center line between the singers and out into the room, what you have is the piano or keys in the middle with the sax player and the guitar player off to the sides. This is 100% intentional. As I knew when it came to mixing, the piano or keys would have some stereo spread and the sax and guitar parts would be panned out to the sides. So we go back to the figure eight mics. My plan in mixing was to basically have them to not only be the vocal mics, but to have them provide some room tone for the guitar, sax and the piano. On the other hand, the sax and the guitar microphones were not only there to provide direct mics for those instruments, but also provide hard panned ambience for the singers. So as you can see, I put a lot of thought into how all of this works together. The bass guitar was actually very quiet, being a double bass, so I placed it out to the side. I think it was probably also because it was the only place it would fit in the room. Bass frequencies are omnidirectional anyway, so I took both a DI signal and a microphone and there was very little bass guitar bleed into the other microphones in the room. So some of that was sent via headphones to those in the band that needed to hear the bass. The piano had several different options for microphones and I used all of them in varying amounts for different songs to play with the tonal balance of the piano as required. The keyboard amplifier was double mic'd and set only as loud as it needed to be for the singers to hear, with some of that sent to the cans for the other musicians as required. And you can also see the room mic in the hallway outside using an omni polar pattern to make it sound even more roomy. This just didn't work in the mix as well as I had hoped, so I think it was struck during mixing. Given the volume of some instruments, I could have placed them slightly differently. These are the sort of things you don't really know 100% until you're in the room. As it was, we ended up using some baffles between the singers and the musicians without losing too much line of sight between the band members, which is really important. What did I learn? I learnt the fine art of microphone placement and committing to the sound during recording and it really paid off. I could have probably got a nice clean recording by recording everyone separately, but it just wouldn't have had that same live performance feel, which was an integral part of the band's sound. Mixing that band was challenging in different ways, as it was more like mixing a live recording on a stage where you have to momentarily push up faders to feature parts, but you still had to leave those mics open slightly just enough when you weren't featuring a part because the loss of ambience without it became very obvious. Luckily the band was incredibly well rehearsed, great players, they did a fantastic job playing together in the studio and our collective efforts paid off really well. We got great recordings that represented the group perfectly and mixing was such a pleasure, not a chore. I hope my story inspires you to go for it and just strive for amazing recordings that have all of the intentions of the mix in mind. There are so many aspects I didn't have time to talk about, but thank you for watching. Please hit me up with any follow-up questions and until next time, happy mixing and recording.